Hello, and welcome everyone to our webinar on climate resilience, what's needed and what's possible. I see people are still popping into the waiting room. So uh, we'll get folks in and then we'll get started. And it's really great to be with you all. Obviously a very uh, important and topical issue to be discussing today. So really glad you're making the time to join us. Happy New Year. My name is Lauren Hurl, and I'm the Executive Director of Vermont Conservation Voters. And for those unfamiliar, VCV is a nonpartisan nonprofit that works to advocate for strong environmental laws, hold lawmakers accountable, and help elect environmental allies. And I'm delighted to be joined by um, some wonderful colleagues today to discuss some key policy ideas that lawmakers will be discussing this legislative session to help Vermont maintain healthier watersheds and reduce the risk of future flooding. And a couple quick logistics before we get going. Uh, so please just stay on mute throughout the presentations and conversations, but we do encourage you to put uh, your thoughts and questions into the chat. We have plenty of time built in for Q&A, so we will get to um, as many questions as we can at, um, at the end. So please just throw in uh, throw in your questions and we'll get to all that we can. Um, we're here today, of course, coming on the heels of the warmest year on record and watching climate disasters ratchet up around the globe and in Vermont and of course experienced devastating flooding in many communities this year, including my hometown of Montpelier. And this disaster came after the unprecedented summer days where we had to keep our kids inside because there was air pollution from regional wildfires. So just seeing these climate disasters really increasing and impacting um, Vermont is, is stark and is really kind of shaking us into action. Um, I know many of you live in impacted communities too, or have friends and family who do. Um, and even as people who have studied and worked on climate change for decades and know that increased disasters are expected, it really just hits you in such a different way to live through a climate disaster that's hurting your neighbors, your local businesses, you know, walking through the streets of downtown Montpelier right after the flooding and seeing the entire contents of people's homes and businesses out on the streets destroyed. It's really heartbreaking and devastating. And in those moments, I know that I was hearing from so many community members, um, you know, what are we going to do to make this type of flooding less likely to happen in the future? And was hearing repeatedly from residents and businesses that they could fathom rebuilding again. And a lot of folks in a lot of our communities around the state have been rebuilding um, their homes, their businesses, uh, but really can't imagine doing this over and over again. And you know, between the financial strain that this is putting on people, uh, the emotional stress, um, we as a state need to be really increasing our efforts to reduce the risk of flooding. Um, so soon after the, the major flooding this summer, the environmental community came together to really think about, you know, what are some of the policy ideas that are going to be ready for action this legislative session? So this is obviously a many year and multifaceted um, issue that we need to be dealing with in all kinds of ways, but we wanted to put on the table um, some policies that would be ready for action and that we could move forward this year to really, um, you know, make an important dent in this issue. So there's already a ton of ideas circulating, um, as there should be. There was a press conference on the first day of the session with a number of legislators from flood impacted communities who released a bill with a suite of ideas uh, looking at how to help local governments, impacted businesses, homeowners, and some ideas on better managing our, wet, our watersheds. Um, so today, though, we wanted to dig in further on an overview of a set of policies where extensive work has been done to develop and vet these ideas. So they really are ready for action. And also acknowledge that this is that the ideas we're going to talk about today are part of a much bigger suite of things that need to be done between investments and again, helping 
our our families who are impacted, helping our businesses, helping our local governments. Um, and we're really looking at how can we manage our watersheds to be reducing risk? So this is a set of ideas that we want to talk about today. So I'm going to turn it um, over to our speakers after I introduce them. And just wanted to note that we did have a couple uh, last minute speaker changes because as many of us, I'm sure, are experiencing, there's a lot of sickness going around. <laughs> so uh, I just uh, appreciate everyone's patience. And um, I thank uh, Karina Daly and John Groveman, who will be speaking with you today, who stepped, Karina was going to be with us anyway, but is covering a little bit more uh, material than planned. And John Groveman stepped up at the last minute. Um, so, and sending our best to Jared Carpenter of Lake Sham Plain Committee and Lauren Oates of the Nature Conservancy in Vermont, who are both dealing with some, some illness. So send them your best. Um, so we're going to hear first from Karina Daly, who is going to discuss um, enhanced wetland protections and issues. She is the restoration ecologist on staff at the Vermont Natural Resources Council. We're then going to hear from John Groveman who is the Policy and Water Program Director at the Vermont Natural Resources Council and is going to discuss policies to improve river corridor and riparian protections. And then we're gonna hear from Karina again to talk about a suite of policies related to dam safety um, and things like investing in the strategic removal of dams that exacerbate flooding. Um, so again, thank you for, uh, for all being with us. And let's first turn it over to hear from Karina about how protecting our wetlands can help enhance flood resilience. Thank you. Uh, um, great to be here. Thank you, Lauren. I'm just going to get my screen up. Give me one second. Can everyone see that? Perfect. Okay, um, so starting out, I just wanted to provide this slide as sort of an overview of what we're talking, one way to visualize it um, in profile view, but this just shows um, the importance or the, the importance of this slide is to demonstrate that intact freshwater systems build climate resilience. And those systems um, need to be connected. So we need to think beyond the health of our our lakes and our ponds, to um, the wetlands, the riparian buffers and river corridors and stream health um, that support those lakes and ponds. So thinking at the watershed scale. And I think this is just a good visual Lauren Oates shared with me on, on those connections. <clears throat> and I am trying to advance to my next slide. Hold on one second. There we go. There's a little delay there. Um, so related to wetland science, wetlands are those unique areas where land and water intersect. And the Clean Water Act was enacted to protect and preserve the functions wetlands provide to society at large. Um, this picture, this is an aerial image, um, infrared picture from the Natural Resource Atlas that just zooms in on a river wetland complex ecosystem and the infrared photography really shows where the wetlands are um, and how they're connected to this larger system. So when we're thinking about river corridors, floodplains, riparian buffers, and wetlands, they all provide, so wetlands provide groundwater that feeds surface water that then flows um, from our headwaters to Lake Champlain. So it's really one system and, and that's the system we need to work better at protecting and connecting. Um, and as it relates to wetlands, um, thinking about wetlands um, at, on a net gain of the value of wetlands for ecosystem services and leaving wetlands in a better state for people and nature from, from what we have. We have a historic history of wetland loss in Vermont. Over 35% of our wetlands have um, been lost since European colonization. So we need to make up for that loss and start thinking about wetland ecosystem services um, as something that we need to protect and enhance and expand upon for the future. Our greatest threat to wetlands is our lack of understanding of them. We, we don't have enough baseline data to document um, clearly 
the wetlands on our landscape, the extent of those wetlands, the connectivity of those wetlands. And, um, and when those wetlands are impacted through development or um, other forms, agricultural crop conversion, that disrupts their functions. And those functions are significant to wetlands in Vermont. There's 10 wetland functions in Vermont. Um, um, you know, many of the important ones are water quality protection. So we need wetlands for filtration. Um, we need wetlands for flood attenuation. So flood protection and storage. We need wetlands for erosion control and sedimentation. Wetlands provide biodiversity to our habitat. So there's 10 wetland functions in Vermont, functions and values, and those are what we're working to protect. And when um, development happens and we disrupt that function, we want to do our best to restore it um, as close as we can to the area. You know, we want our, to do our best to avoid it, number one, first and foremost. But when there is an impact that is authorized um, for the public good, then we need to work hard to restore that function as close as we can on the landscape. So that is what this proposed policy does is it looks to, um, it, it proposes a two to one mitigation ratio for enhancing wetlands. So for every wetland loss, we would um, enhance, conserve, restore wetlands. Um, we would double that, so a two to one ratio. And I discussed before the rate of loss is significant. And then the capacity, we need to have people on the ground supporting this work. We can't have these policies without um, implementers, um, wetland scientists at the state level to carry out this good work. So I spoke about the net gain of wetland acreage, that two to one ratio, putting that in, um, in statute. Right now, there I can say that um, the Vermont Wetlands Program has been doing an excellent job with mitigating wetlands and typically a two to one ratio is required for authorized projects when when projects are permitted, um, but that is not in statute. So that's what we're looking to looking towards here with this proposed policy. And then the mapping. So we need to have that baseline data to track our wetland loss and our wetland gain. Um, as we move forward. So we need the National Wetlands Inventory Mapping at a statewide level. Um, that needs to be updated more frequently than it is now, and we currently don't have it for the entire state. So that's what this policy proposes, as well as um, updates annually to our Vermont Significant Wetlands layer. So the NWI layer is a, is a national mapping layer that um, you can you can go to, to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service wet light website and look at that NWI data, but that data um, needs to be collected for Vermont specifically statewide and then updated into the Vermont Significant Wetlands layer, which would happen annually. And then in addition to that is just increased quality of wet, wetland reporting on our status and trends so we can celebrate um, those enhancement mitigation that net gain of wetlands and track the loss and keep track of site visits, permits, um, violations, trends, so all of that good stuff. And I will pause there and pass it over to John. So I will stop sharing my screen to talk about rivers and riparian buffers. Yeah, thanks, Karina. Hello, everybody. So, I will do my best to pinch it for Laura Notes. I am not a scientist. I am a lawyer um, and a person who works on policy issues, but I've been around scientists and these issues enough that I think I could provide you with some useful information. So really what I want to do is um, kind of focus on what is in the legislation. I'm going to focus on what's in the legislation with regard to river corridor protection and riparian areas. Talk a little bit about what those are, although scanning the people on this call, I think that most of you you know, have, have good knowledge basically of what we're talking about, but just to set, that, to set the context. But I do wanna mention out up front that, um, so S-213 is the bill in the Senate that will contain all of the provisions that we're talking about today. It, it contains um, new provisions to protect 
river corridors and riparian areas from development, wetlands um, from development, and uh, basically create a, um, a new policy of, of actually gaining wetlands rather than losing wetlands uh, because of their flood resilience um, uh, values. And then also we'll address dams, which Karina is going to talk about. Um, at the at the end, so go look up S two thirteen, and I'll reference it as I as I go through the river corridor riparian area part. So, river corridors and riparian areas. So, what are we talking about? So, in Vermont, um, Vermont has been a leader for decades in recognizing that not only do we need to protect floodplains, the the, the areas of land adjacent to our rivers, that when we see floods, as we saw this July, as we saw during Irene, as we saw just a few weeks ago um, in December. Um, it's the area where, where the kind of the water spills out uh, onto the floodplain and um, hopefully there's no nothing built. We try not to build in the floodplain to minimize damage to infrastructure and to you know uh, people's homes um, and then the and the associated negative impacts to water quality when that happens. And FEMA, as you know, the Federal Emergency Management Agency plays a large role in regulating development in floodplains. But in Vermont, what we've been a leader in is that we not only recognize the need to protect these, these, these floodplains, but we need to protect river corridors. And river corridors are basically, it's the area of land that surrounds a river that we know um, are going to move over time. Rivers are dynamic systems. They're not static. Um, as Vermonters, with um, so many of our traditional settlements built along rivers, we see how the roads are along the rivers, how there's often um, stonework and riprap and other man-made features that are there to kind of keep the river in place to protect the infrastructure that we have. And, um, you know, we've realized in Vermont that this is a real tension because the rivers want to move. We're keeping the rivers from moving. And really what we need to do is not only protect floodplains, but also uh, understand where the rivers are gonna move over time, where possible, give those rivers the opportunity to move and then do not uh, develop further in these areas. So not only don't develop in the, in the floodplain right next to the, where the river is now, anticipate where the river is going to go um, and protect those areas as well. And I'm sure I saw it, I live in Marshfield right along the upper Winooski, I've been living here for almost 30 years. And with every flood event that we've had, major and minor, I see the upper Brunuski wanting to move across a, a farm field. And up until July, every year, the river would move. It would often like push the rocks and the riprap away. And then the select board would put it back. They would put that riprap back. They'd put the river back in the channel where it was. Well, finally in July, the river said no more. And it busted through all of the riprap, cut like a, a deep channel that exists today. So now we have a new branch of the upper room Winooski in Marshfield. And that's kind of what we're talking about. And I'm sure many of you have seen that where you live. We want to anticipate where these rivers want to go, where they will go, and then address development in these areas. So part of S213 would uh, require that the Agency of Natural Resources, by January 1st, 2026, create a new permitting program to regulate activities and development within these river corridor areas. Um, the, the bill has some, some key parts of the bill with, in terms of the program are that um, the a ANR will have to develop rules uh, uh, regarding permits and what are the criteria for issuing permits in these areas. And, um, the area of jurisdiction where permits are required are gonna be in map river corridors and that's defined in the bill. And that's been another feature of where Vermont has been a leader in this area. So not only has Vermont for decades recognized that we need to protect these river corridors, we've been mapping these river corridors. So the idea is to use these river corridor maps that exist, they're on the Natural Resources Atlas. Um, so you can go um, on the Atlas and you can see where the river corridors are. And these map river corridors are gonna be the basis for um, ANR's new program to regulate development. Now, importantly, in addition to needing to protect river corridors, so when we have floods in the future, which we know we will, 
we we see, we do not see harm to new development and infrastructure that we we allow rivers room to move so it, it decreases erosion and uh, flooding impacts downstream. Um, we also know that we need to protect the areas along streams, which are called riparian areas, uh, because as we saw in the July flood, some of the greatest damage was done by streams feeding these rivers, just blowing out and flooding houses and causing landslides in some cases. And that's an extreme example, but um, that's what's going to happen with these significant flood events. And leaving land around these streams undeveloped will help to absorb some of these flood impacts. And it has just generally protecting riparian areas has significant water quality benefits and benefits for fish habitat by reducing erosion and providing shading um, that for fish habitat. So one of the tensions in S213 is to what extent will these riparian areas be protected by ANR in this new program? The map river corridor is that um, that ANR has uh, has mapped do include some of the larger tributaries to rivers and the ANR's own uh, website and um, program for river mapping says that there should be protection for these riparian areas on these sort of major streams that are feeding river corridors. We 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 lobbied as the bill was written S two thirteen for specific provisions to protect um, the land around these riparian, riparian areas. Those specific provisions did not get in the bill. Um, although, you know, we're analyzing the bill now and I think you could read it to require ANR to, you know, include this riparian protection in their uh, new permitting program, but we're gonna be advocating to make it explicit. In addition, last year, the legislature required the Agency of Natural Resources to conduct a study on protecting riparian areas, areas of even smaller streams throughout the state. So basically, essentially all streams, the land around all streams, not just these major tributaries that have been mapped as part of the River Corridor Program would be protected by the state. ANR was supposed to produce that report uh, this January. They asked for an extension due to the flood and, and the, you know, the, the fact that they had to dedicate significant resources to deal with the flood. That's understandable. We understand that. But the the study will be done this year. So we're really hoping, we're really hoping that in addition to getting an S213, this river corridor protection program and protection for some of the major streams that feed these rivers, that this will just be sort of a first step to protecting uh, the riparian areas, the land around streams all throughout the state. So go look up S213 and you'll see that provision. But that's something you'll hear from VNRC as we go through the session, as we are really gonna be advocating for the legislature to you know, adopt this river corridor protect program, but look to ex expand it in, in um, going forward based on the ANR, based on the ANR study. And the last thing I'll say is this won't be easy. It won't be easy uh, with regard to increasing wetland protection and river corridor protection and even riparian area protection for these larger streams um, and, and some of the dam issues that Karina is going to talk about. There's always pushback on new regulatory programs. Um, we need these programs in order to, as Lauren said up front, uh, mitigate the, the damage from floods that we know are going to come. It's the only way. We need to proactively uh, address the development and adverse impacts to these areas that occur if we don't have these these oversight programs. So there's going to be pushback. So you know, if you agree with these proposals, we really need your help to let the legislature know that these are vital baseline steps that we need to take to begin to mitigate impacts of flood and to make us more climate resilient. So I think that is all that I have to say about that. Um, so back to Karina for dams. More dams. Dam, dams. Oh, now I'm back to my slide one. Hold on, let me get to my dams. Okay. Can everyone see this as the dams? Okay, thank you, Lauren. Um, so thank you, John, for 
sharing S213, the overview. I failed to mention that, the number of the bill. just um, We just learned that last week, so that's exciting. Um, so John's talked about the riparian buffer and river corridor. I gave you an overview on wetlands, and now we're going to talk about the barriers to natural system function, so dams. Uh, man, dams are a man-made barrier to a river system. They disrupt river function, uh, so they block um, a river's ability to transport sediment and nutrients downstream and for wildlife uh, aquatic organisms to move up and down a system. When you impound a system with a dam, you basically change an ecosystem. So the water that builds up behind that dam warms up in temperature, um, which attracts different fish species. So you have um, warm water fish species such as bass and sunfish versus the cold water um, brook trout that Vermont is known for. Um, when you have a dam, the sediment that collects behind that dam, so water that would normally be flowing freely down that system builds up and that water moves, you know, it's not just water, it's sediment, nutrients, um, and that builds up behind the dam, um, which then raises the water level behind. So there's sediment build up behind the dam, there's warmer water building up behind the dam, and the, the river level can actually be higher in those areas. Flood control dams are those dams that are managed for flooding, um, and they were they were built for that, and they're constantly dredged behind that dam um, to maintain um, a storage basin for that river. There are only eight flood control dams in Vermont um, that are managed that way. These other dams, um, over a thousand dams in Vermont, are derelict, unused dams that no longer serve a useful purpose. And those are the dams that are actually exacerbating flooding and pose a risk to, uh, as well, a risk to wildlife, public safety, um, fish habitat. So, so these are the dams that we're talking about today. And really the best thing to do is remove them when we can. Um, they warm the water up. They're a public health concern just from a water quality perspective. They block um, a river's connection. So there's that that longitudinal connection of blocking the river's flow, but also, you know, not allowing that river to connect to its floodplain, to its river corridor that John talked about. Um, so they disconnect a river from its historic floodplain. They can also disconnect a river from its wetlands. Um, and they cost a lot of money, excuse me, I jumped too fast, um, to maintain. Um, so it's a huge economic burden when these dams, um, to maintain these dams and to keep them going when they are a, a public safety risk. This is a picture of Cross Brothers Dam on the left in Northfield, Vermont. And this dam is planned for removal. It's been in the works since um, 2019. The town owns this dam and they fully support removal of it. We are continuing to wait for funding for this dam. It's on a FEMA track, um, but we have yet to receive the funding. We hope that that will happen soon. But a preliminary engineering analysis has showed that the removal of this dam will lower the flood elevation for 10 homes, the 100 year flood elevation for 10 homes in Northfield. So this is a big deal when we are paying, I think Laura Notes said $2 million for free floodplain buyouts um, for homes when we could spend half a million on this dam removal and hopefully save 10 homes. So that's a, a big difference from a cost perspective. And this is a dam in East Calais um, that blew during the, the July storm. Um, basically, there was a failure here where water um, over overcapped the dam and eroded on the backside of the dam downstream. And this dam is also um, on a path to removal. The landowners no longer want the liability of maintaining this dam. They don't have the funds to maintain it. And the best thing for it is to reconnect this river system and remove, remove that dam. So the policy that is proposed through S213 is um, includes a lot of dam safety. We have a lot of work to do to keep our dams 
um, those dams that we want to remain to keep them safe. So through um, routine inspections and maintenance and reporting. Um, but those dams that no longer need to be here, we need to have the funds to act swiftly to remove those dams. So um, there's a change to our dam petition. So this unsafe dam petition is a part of the policy that would make it easier to petition to remove a dam um, or repair a dam as needed. There's improvements on the inspection of dams um, and then the reporting would have more transparency. So a requirement for the reporting to be available online so that we would um, all have access to those dam reports um, for the inspections that are completed. And then there would be a fund um, called the Dam Safety Revolving Loan Fund that would be a forgivable loan for those dams that plan to be removed ultimately, um, and a low interest loan for those land, those dams that ultimately need to be repaired. And this, um, the nuances of this um, loan fund have to do with the hazard rating of the dam. So significant and high hazard dams would be prioritized. And um, basically it's a way to access funds to remove those dams as swiftly as we can. And also if they can't be removed, um, to think carefully about their continued maintenance and make sure there's a plan for that long-term maintenance for the dam itself. And, and to make sure that we're thinking about removal in all aspects of which dams we continue to maintain. And then um, liability, the portion of the policy transfers liability from a negligence standard to a strict liability standard. So it holds dam landowners accountable for the dams that they own. And, um, and then transfer of jurisdiction, which um, we're still working on that piece of the policy, but there are 21 dams that are owned by the public uh, that have oversight through the Public Utilities Commission versus dam safety. And we would want to transfer that jurisdiction. It's, it's inconsistent and it's not effective to have two different forms of state government managing dams because the Public Utilities Commission doesn't have the engineers on staff to appropriately take care of the dam. So they're constantly having to update their, their policy after dam safety updates theirs. So we're looking to transfer that jurisdiction over to the dam safety program so that the same engineers can be working on protecting the safety of all of these dams. And ultimately, um, we, we need to reconnect our rivers so that our rivers can provide the function that they do best for climate resilience. To keep our communities safe, we need to let our rivers flow free. So just leaving you with this with this graphic. And I'll leave it at that and we can open it up to discussion or I'll transfer it back to Lauren. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, John and Karina. And so yeah, we're going to transition to Q&A. And um, as we do that, I do want to say a quick thank you to the elected officials who have joined us. I see Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman, I see Senator Irene Renner. I see Representative Bobby Farlis Rubio. If I missed anyone else, I keep scanning, but it keeps changing. So please feel free to introduce yourself. It's really great to have um, electeds hearing this. We are recording this and we'll share this more broadly. I know Mondays are the day legislators have off um, and have to do a lot of other work <laughs> in their lives. So really grateful for those of you who made the time today. Um, it's, it's great to see you here. And obviously you'll be critical partners in advancing climate resilience this year. So thank you. Um, so again, today we're talking about this suite of strategies, which are a piece of what we can be doing to improve climate resilience by fostering healthy watersheds. As uh, we mentioned, these ideas are reflected in a bill S-213 that was introduced in the Senate, and the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee began walking through the bill last week and began initial testimony so this suite of policies will be a top priority for our organizations. 
Um, and again, these ideas have been around and have been kind of under consideration and development for a while. There were two bills last year, H29 and H30, for example, that um, looked at wetlands and looked at river corridors. Um, so the House Committee on Environment and Energy will be bringing up these bills um, as well. And, and again, just noting that climate resilience is such a big topic and one of our uh, one of our comments and questions was related to, to thinking beyond just the ideas we're talking about today. Um, and we'll try to get to that in a little more detail. Um, but just, just of course, acknowledging that this is this is a piece of what we need to be doing. Um, but we see this suite of strategies better protecting wetlands, our river corridors and riparian areas, and improving how we're managing dams in the state as really important and valuable components that we could move forward this year to improve our resilience and reduce flood risk in our community. So we're really excited about them. Um, and we'll keep you updated and um, give you ways to get involved um, if you stay in tune with our organizations. So let's get now to Q&A. Um, so just looking through the chat, uh, let's see. So let's do some easy ones. Does the Supreme Court decision have, um, the SACA decision have any bearing on these proposed policies in Vermont? I don't know, John is our lawyer, uh, if you wanna take that one. Yes, a non-science question that's very exciting. Um, probably, um, you know, it's a good lawyer answer, right? Um, the SACA decision, for those who you don't follow this as closely as uh, some of us lawyers do is, uh, this summer, there was a decision from the U.S. Supreme Court that narrowed the definition of what is a water of the United States for the purpose of the water being protected um, under the Clean Water Act. But previously, there were decisions at the Supreme Court and rules from EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers that had said that um, not only are you know our larger you know river systems protected and the streams that feed those rivers, but wetlands that you know um, are part just part of the of the watershed that help protect those streams. So it was a broad definition of waters protected under the Clean Water Act, and the Supreme Court ruled that no, uh, there's a narrower narrower protections under the Clean Water Act, and only wetlands and that are have a continuous hydrologic connection to waters are protected. So by some estimate, um, this has narrowed uh, the waters protected by the Clean Water Act by, you know, as much as 30 percent uh, or more of the waters in, in the United States. So therefore, there are now a number of waters who won't be protected through Clean Water Act federal, you know, permitting. Um, I think, you know, and Vermont has a long for a long since 1990 has had its own wetlands protection program. Vermont has a broader definition of waters than the federal government does in terms of um, when we require, you know, a permit for any discharge or impacts to waters. Um, so I think, you know, I, I, I think, you know, Vermont is in better shape than some places, but we do need to be more vigilant and do more with our own state laws because we can no longer there, there are federal permits that would have been required previously to help protect wetlands in particular that won't be required anymore. So I think it, with regard to the wetlands part of S213 in particular, it's really important to uh, enhance our wetland protection law because we can't rely on the federal government um, any longer to, to, to weigh in where we could before. And I think the other parts of S213 that will protect riparian areas and river corridors, um, you know, will also help buttress the effect of losing some of that federal protection by using like a different set of uh, tools to, to address development and impacts to these ecological areas along, you know, our river and stream systems. So, so yeah, so I guess the sort of, you know, in some way it definitely affects Vermont's in better shape than other states, but the, the Sackett decision has thrown a curveball to the whole country in terms of protection of water resources. Thanks, John. And transitioning to um, the next question in the chat that was asking about what might be recommended for small urban streams 
and maybe expand that out to thinking about how, um, you know, what we've been thinking about and what's been happening related to um, streams and riparian protections in general. I don't know which of you want to take the first crack at that. You want to take a swing at that, Karina, or you want to? Um, sure, I'll start, John, and you can fill in. Um, so at this point, the proposed legislation does not um, protect our small urban streams from a river corridor um, or riparian buffer um, statewide approach. But certainly, you know, every town does have their own setbacks for small streams. Um, I live in Jericho and it's a 50 foot setback. Um, so that does should help protect the riparian buffer on some level. Um, but we need we need to think about those small streams. And certainly in the July flood, there was a lot of small streams that became huge streams and changed courses and impacted homes as well. Um, those those streams get really technical from a planning perspective as far as how to incorporate them, but um, we need to continue to think about it and they're really important as well. And it's just that concept of thinking about where our groundwater meets our surface water and defining those wetlands. Um, maybe that small stream was a wetland before it was a small stream, or maybe the, the headwaters of that are a wetland that need to be protected. Um, so thinking of it on the watershed scale and protecting it at that level. John, I don't know if you want to say anything more. Yeah, that's a great answer. I would just add a couple of things. One is that, it's, you know, how do you define small? I think some of the streams that did have a significant effect in the July flood in urban areas, like for example, in Barrie and Montpelier, like in Montpelier, there were streams like coming off of um, Hubbard Park that caused a tremendous amount of damage. And in Barrie, some of the worst damage to um, some of the housing um, in the north part of Barrie were from streams that may be part of Map River Corridors. I mean, they were large enough that they might be encompassed by S213. Um, and in that case, a and R's own policy basically calls for uh, a 50 foot uh, undisturbed uh, riparian buffer area around those streams. And so the bill um, requires, as I mentioned earlier, a and R to adopt rules around what are the criteria for permitting for river quarters and these larger riparian areas. And um, yeah, so it remains to be seen what those rules would say. But EP, you know, right now, a and R is saying they should have a 50 foot um undisturbed uh buffer area for those streams and then for the smaller streams i agree with what karina said that th it gets back to the anr study you know we'll, we'll we'll provide updates on that it's a, that's why it is really important study that anr is undertaking to get to the smaller rural and urban streams and to uh they were supposed to lay out in this study and i assume they will um so what are the ways to protect these smaller streams and what kind of a program at the state level must ex you know should exist and there'll be a debate about um that i think through the study and then hopefully into a bill and the question actually reminded me i, I meant to say before and i didn't is that so like the the river quarter right parent area protections are needed because as karina said right now it's town by town essentially like right now it's you know some towns have protections for for river corridors, some towns have protection for small or large streams, um, but it varies and it's the minority of towns. The state gets involved with these issues if an Act 250 permit is required or if there's a renewable energy project that goes through the Public Utility Commission's, um, what they call Section 248 process. But those are the vast minority of, of projects in the state. So we need this bill to sort of get away from this patchwork approach and basically have a uniform statewide program to protect these areas, starting with river corridors and the larger tributaries and expanding out to smaller urban and rural um, streams. Thank you both. And just picking up, there was a, a follow-up um, looking at, you know, what if we're looking at development that happened before setbacks and local regulations? So, just if you could put a finer point on how this might help um, even streams where development has occurred, like if we 
increase vegetated buffers or I don't know what, yeah. what, what our scientists would say. I mean, you know, we, you know, th this was, this was just a classic, you know, conundrum of creating like new um, environmental protection programs. But so the program is prospective, you know, trying to prevent future activities that we know would harm the functions and values of riparian areas and river corridors, but also put um, development in harm's way. I, you know, I, it's a, it's another related set of issues. And Lauren, you can speak to this just as a city council person in Montpelier. What do you do with regard to existing development in river corridors that's in harm's way, is being harmed? We, I think probably everybody's familiar with all the buyout programs and discussions from the FEMA level. Um, but um, so I think, that, you know, the, the focus of S213 is prospective. But there will be a lot of talk in the legislature, and it wouldn't be inappropriate for S213 to include, or maybe it would just be in some of the funding bills, what is the state willing to do in terms of putting resources up to deal with existing development that we know is in harm's way, will we'll get harmed and harm you know, water quality and downstream users. Great. Thank you. Um... So we had a question from Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman, um, and this I think should go to Karina. So can you give us um, the quick overview again? So where are dams appropriate, whether for flood resilience or um, renewable energy was mentioned? So could you just speak to the differences between different types of dams on the landscape and how um, this legislation really quickly might contemplate dealing with that. Yeah, well, I will just say first, um, I think the, and this is an American Rivers quote, but the fastest way to heal a river is to remove a dam. So all dams are bad, in my opinion. Um, that being said, we have, you know, inherited our development patterns um, from those that came before us. And we have, you know, we've built our, our cities around our rivers. Um, because our river was a resource at that time to provide power. And so it, it made sense then, and we can't we can't move all of that. So I'm not saying that. And so we have some dams that were built for flood control to protect that development. And Wrightsville Reservoir, Waterbury Reservoir, and East Barry are all examples of that. Um, and there's five other dams on the Connecticut. So those are our flood control dams. And those are the ones that are managed for flood control regularly and need to be maintained for that purpose. Um, but those, those are the dams that we need. In my opinion, the rest of the dams we don't need and they are exacerbating um, flooding. From a hydropower perspective, hydropower is not considered a renewable energy in in my opinion and in many people's opinions because of the impact it causes on river systems so that the ecological impact of dams um, isn't worth the the power gain so it's it's really not an efficient form of renewable energy at this point in time based on the impact of that impoundment the temperature change on a river system the impact to wildlife the impact to public safety um, and clean water. So I think that, does that answer all of that question <laughs> for now? <laughs> that, thank you. That's, that's a good quick overview. Um, and, and again, the, the legislation would deal with different dams differently and yes, as kind of provisions for oversight, maintenance, um, and removal where, where we can. Um, so we have a question here uh, from Senator Renner asking about um, if you have, so this was a specific example, but I think maybe you could just speak to kind of how this kind of uh, situation on the landscape might play out. So uh, the question was when a wet area um, that might be suspected to be a wetland, but a consultant deems okay to develop, it becomes wetter, for example, because of nearby uh, landowner cutting down trees. Is there recourse for residents to have the state or someone else come in and evaluate the land as whether it has become a wetland? So maybe Karina, you could speak to both just kind of like that situation and then how the improved mapping and data that we're trying to get is a key part of um, helping kind of prevent this kind of thing maybe <laughs> too. Yes, I think it's been, it's re been really confusing for a lot of 
people, um, including municipalities, to, you know, provide guidance on development as it relates to wetlands because the wetlands haven't been accurately mapped in the state. Um, and it's really inconsistent depending on where you are in the state. Um, so you can never use the map as a planning tool. It's not, um, you know, it's it's subject to change. It needs to be updated. We constantly need more science to update those wetlands. But wetlands change over time. And so the delineations um, need to be completed every five years to be current. So someone can always hire um, a wetland consultant. There's a list on the Department of Wetlands DEC's website for wetland consultants in the state and come out and evaluate that. You're welcome to have a second opinion. You're welcome to call a district wetland ecologist um, in your region and invite them out to look at the site. So those are ways you can accurately delineate, um, identify the wetland upland boundary in that area. Um, and uh, I'm just looking at the question to see if I've answered it thoroughly. Yeah, and, and as far as it becoming wetter base, so that's, that's there's examples of that on river systems too, when we, um, you know, when we, put up rocks along our river to protect our channel, it puts the pressure downstream. Certainly people who are cutting trees in one area of a wetland, and if you're downstream of that or you know below that uh, in a wetland complex, then you may have more water. Um, with the increase in frequency of, of storm events, I think our wetlands will be getting wetler, wetter. So, so these are all things that we need to be mindful of um, as a, as a as it relates to living with our neighbors and protecting our natural resources. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we had a question about um, what role conservation easements can play in addressing um, some of these problems, especially when we're thinking about private ownership of land along streams and rivers, for example. Uh, so I don't know, Karina or John, if either of you have thoughts on that. I mean, they already play, they can, they, conservation easements can be really effective tools. They're used now. There is a river corridor easement program that exists where there's some fun funding is available, um, as well as land trusts raising money to, to uh, also identify, you know, especially land along river corridors as, um, priority land to conserve for all the benefits of making sure that you don't get um, development and adverse effects in the, to the functions and values of the river corridor. Um, so I think that's a, those are great programs and they're ongoing, but they're not enough. You can't, you can't really, you know, you can't address all of the river corridor impacts through uh, sort of, you know, the easement programs and sort of voluntary measures. So, um, they certainly have been a big help now, but I think our argument is that we need a comprehensive statewide approach to protect river corridors, riparian areas, and wetlands to make us climate resilient. You know, we can't rely on this kind of patchwork town by town, easement by easement, sort of, you know, landowner by landowner approach. We, we won't get to where we need to. Um, and so that's that's sort of the that's sort of the 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 thesis of our argument. Thank you both. All right, trying to get to as many questions. We've got just a couple minutes left. Um, there were a couple uh, questions raised about hydropower dams. Um, just wanted to note, you know, Karina speaking as a uh, river scientist with uh, a deep appreciation for healthy rivers is saying that you know, she doesn't see them as a renewable energy resource. The state of Vermont renewable energy standard does acknowledge hydropower. Uh, there is going to be an update to the renewable energy standard this year. Um, so stay tuned on that. Um, my, my understanding is that that is not going to change kind of current baseload power or change definitions of hydro in terms of um, counting as renewable energy, except for large scale hydro in the future would not be part of um, part of the mix. 
Um, but again, stay tuned for with people who are more in the weeds on that particular policy, but that is going to be kind of an ongoing um, conversation at the state house about our renewable energy standard and how we're getting our electricity. So um, that just noting that um, did want to get to, um, we've got a question from Representative Farley's Rubio about beaver dams. Maybe a, just a quick, how do we think of beaver dams compared to other types of dams? Yeah, and I just wanted to also clarify that the S213 doesn't, so that addresses dam safety for all non-federal, non-hydro, non-powered dams. So we're not talking in this legislation specifically about um, the safety of our FERC licensed dams or Army Corps of Engineers dams. So, so this dam safety legislation is non-power, non-federal dams. Yeah, and um, I would add, I would add that um, this doesn't change the federal licensing for hydroelectric dams that all already have to get a water quality certificate from the Agency of Natural Resources to show that they can meet water quality standards. So that's the law today. It's been the law for over 50 years. Um, and VNRC and the state and other environmental groups engage consistently in those processes to make sure that hydropower um, is licensed and relicensed in a way that meets water quality standards and doesn't harm fish. So that's the current policy um, and process and rules around that. And the bill doesn't and, change that. Thank you, John. And related to beavers, we love beavers and we love beaver dams. So I'm I was talking about man-made dams, um, concrete barriers. Beaver dams are excellent. They're naturally made. We, in fact, with a lot of our dam removal projects that I oversee, we incorporate beaver dam. Um, well, there's usually beaver habitat upstream and downstream of these projects. And it's really amazing to watch the beavers respond to the changes in the river when we remove the dam because they build a dam right where it was usually because it's sort of a bedrock outcrop, a natural constriction in the river. So beavers want to take over this job and they'll do a nice job. And those dams, you know, they blow out during storm events, beaver dams. Um, fish can go get up through them. They're not changing water temperature substantially in a lot of systems. So we fully support beaver dams um, and love them. I, and I think there was one question about run of river dams for um, hydropower. Certainly run of river dams are better than um, peaking dams and impounding systems, but they still block habitat. So they still don't transport sediment and nutrients down a system. The water flows over the dam, um, the rivers, the fish can't swim upstream, um, nor can aquatic organisms. So there, there's still, there's still impact there, certainly. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, and we are at time. I did just want to note, we got a great uh, question about thinking more broadly. You know, again, we know that this set of policies sits within a much larger conversation around climate resilience. Uh, Maggie O'Brien with Rutland uh, Regional Planning Commission was asking about how other people are thinking about that. I know there are a lot of really smart, thoughtful people on this webinar, so I encourage you to uh, reach out to Maggie if you have thoughts on, you know, how are other people thinking about um, things for climate resilience beyond risk assessment, hazard mitigation, and such. And so just encourage you all, if you have a quick thought, we'll be on for, <laughs> for one more minute, um, or please reach out to her. And all of us need to be having these conversations all over the state. So thank you for raising those issues. Sorry to get a chance to get to everyone, but I do want to respect everyone's time and get out. So again, so grateful for everyone for making the time to join us today. Really important and really grateful that we can be coming in with some ideas to really improve flood resilience on our landscape this year. We'll be calling on the legislature to move forward these ideas. Um, if you are, you know, please stay up to date with the VNRC and Vermont Conservation Voters. Um, if you sign up for our email list, for example, we send out regular updates, ways to get involved. Uh, so thank you all again for joining us. Uh, please stay tuned and we hope you will join us at a future webinar as we try to keep you updated on how these are all moving forward. Have a great day, everyone. Take care.